Family, we usually don't have the same impact as we do on another holiday, but happy Father's Day. You say you don't have the same impact. Let me tell you a story. Just listening to some teachers this morning. Men, I've never heard this about a mother. But as they made gifts to give to dad on Father's Day in the public school, what happens if you're a teacher and a little student raises their hand and says, we have a court order not to see dad. How do you handle that? What happens when another student raises their hand and says, dad's in jail, who do I give this gift to? I want to suggest to you today, you and I get more stuff than mom does. All right? We really do. She never gets the remote, you do. All right? Not too many times. Uh, I'm 64 years old. If I go home and visit my 89 year old father, I know what will happen. We will get up from the dinner table. And he says, boy, get me a bowl of ice cream. I'm bald and near retirement, and he still calls me boy. All right? You either do it the same way that he did, or you're on the receiving end if your father's still alive. You've got advantages of being a male that Mother's Day will never experience. But I want you to understand I believe you have expectation in the eyes and the mind of God that they never will either. Please do me a favor. Make your home a treasure. So your kids walk into the home and go, this is the coolest spot in the world. Because dad's here and dad's the fun one. Let's be fair. When it's all said and done, you're going to get credit for a lot of things you never did. Mom did them all. All right? You'll get credit for home stuff. Your, your wife did it all. You know that. You're going to get credit for order and structure in your home. Mom did it all. So if you're going to get the compliment, all right, it's people on the street will say, he would do anything for his kids. I want you to understand, from my perspective, I've never heard that compliment given to a man who literally did anything for his kids. I find that to be a cheap compliment given to dads who don't do their job. Dads who do their job are not seen because they're too busy doing their job. Happy Father's Day. Now I'm supposed to say this later on, all right? But we have a crumble cookie for you. All right? Now, in Mother's Day, there was such a mad rush for for that candy that we just about had a WWE wrestle off for all of it, all right? And we were about 30 short. All right? So if you're a father, take a cookie. If you're if you have a real dear friend, son, somebody you like, somebody who's a neighbor that n- didn't come to church, they don't get a cookie. All right? The father that's sitting with his family and sitting in this room, he gets a cookie. If they're ministering out, they get a cookie. Earn your cookie. All right? and then enjoy it right in front of your family, because it's good, I tell you. Family, I want to take you into a psalm today that beat the dickens out of me. And I hope to share the same beating that I got from my Lord this week. But before that, I need to set this up with a man who I find just engaging every time I have a chance to read about him, never had, a, never had a chance or privilege to meet him, Louis Zamperini should have and could have been the, the Tom Brady of his generation. 
1936, at 19 years of age, he tied the American record for the 10,000 meter race, qualifying to head into the Olympics. Didn't finish strong as a 19 year old, anticipated 1940, and that was going to be his year. World War II struck. In World War II, he was flying in the Pacific Theater. His plane went down on poor mechanics. And as they kicked the door open and then the two-man raft, three men went to that two-man raft. Two would stay the entire 47 days. One would die in that raft while they were pleading and waiting for rescue. They were rescued by the Japanese. Eventually, he would go from the ship in which he was abused to the POW camps of Japan where he was tortured. Louis Zamperini lived for vengeance. If you've seen the movie Unbroken, you have some idea of what he experienced. But what we don't fully appreciate is he came home, he married a woman who loved him dearly. And even though he suffered from PTSD, having what he describes as never a free night where he didn't relive what was going on at a POW camp somewhere in his mind. Anger, alcoholism, lust. He fathered, he fathered a baby and the two of them had heirs of normality. She was ready to sign papers for his divorce and had actually signed those papers but she decided to go to the Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles in 1949. There she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She went home to plead with him, please come to a service. So he went to the first service, left angry. And again, hoping against hope, she pleaded with him all day, please come to the next service. He says, I will. But when he gives that invitation, that altar call, I'm leaving. Well, he did. He left. Except instead of going out the back door, he went down to the altar. And the next day, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He said that was the last night that he ever had a panic attack. The last night that he ever lived in the confines of waking up in stress. Family, he was redeemed. Now, Louis Zamperini discovered the joy of knowing the forgiveness of God. And so I want to come to you today on probably one of the most meaningful psalms of my ten from book one of the psalms. Psalm 32. Take your Bibles, come into us this morning, join us there. If you watch by screen, that's good. I want to suggest to you if you watch by your own Bibles or your cell phone that has the right app, join in. If you're watching Bejeweled this morning, neighbor, catch them. Join with me as we read these 11 verses together. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away from my groanings all day. By day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they will not reach you. You are a hiding place for me. 
You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. May or many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So family, when you read this, this psalm, what I want you to hear is David's passionate excitement about being forgiven. All right? He recognizes, in light of all of his life sin, that God has forgiven him. And this is not just cool for him. This is passionate. He is so appreciative. Now, this psalm is called a maskil. Maskil simply means instruction. So you're not just reading a passionate psalm about a man who's forgiven. Since this is a maskil, he's doing you and I a favor. He's teaching us what it's like to be forgiven. He's teaching us emotionally what it's like. He's teaching us theologically what it's like. And in the end, he's teaching us how a person in the fullness of the awareness of forgiven should really act, feel, and know. And it's a real privilege to really grasp this psalm. This is not just a song, but potentially and lyrically one of the greatest hymns that may have ever been put to pen. What an incredible tool for us. So, many people are going to tie this to David and Bathsheba's sin. But let me let you in on a little secret. Maybe whether you realize it or not, David had other sins in his life other than those two. So, if David is a man after God's own heart, wouldn't you expect every time he sins, there should be a, a renewal and a repentance and a coming back and a renewed sense of excitement. And when it happened again, a repentance and a renewed sense of excitement. And when it happened again, a repentance and a renewed sense of excitement. And you say, well, wait a second, Pete, doesn't that sound like he's doing that a lot? Yes. And why am I suggesting it? Because I think David was just like you and me. And it would happen over and over and over and over again. And if you can grasp the excitement of David, of having that renewed walk with the Lord, a renewed understanding of all that God did for you, I believe it will have an impact in your life. Because let's be fair, as we celebrate Father's Day, fathers, you would never treat your wife like we treat the Heavenly Father and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You'd never treat Christ that way, would you? Unfortunately, that's how you treat Christ over and over again. You'd never treat your mate with the same bad attitude over and over and over and over and over again. And if you did, that's why your wife or your, your mate has a right foot. She'd fight back and you'd get one. So family, understand, we, we really have a chance to see the, the love of Jesus Christ and more so the love of a believer who understands that they've been forgiven as we enter into this text of Scripture. So I want you to see in the first few verses, the first two verses, there's an, ex, an expectation. He gives us a completeness of forgiveness. And we've simply called this in, in verses 1 and 2 the big picture. He gives this to us all expressed here in verses 1 and 2. He starts off with the word blessed. Now it's gone 32 chapters. We started in chapter 1 with blessed is the man who walks after the counsel of God. This is the second one. And it's the only two in this first book that starts with blessed. So you're happy if you're a righteous man, but even more so you're happy if you're a forgiven man. 
So David starts with that idea. And he lives and he is passionate because having lived in a time of extended guilt, he knows the privilege of being free and moving forward away from crushing guilt. And now the happiness is going to be expressed in three, excuse me, three ways. There is a sin and the forgiveness. And so I want you to notice, he says, his transgression is forgiven. Transgression would be better said here, revolt or rebel. Family, I want you to understand, I, I believe you will never understand, you will never understand the actions of our behavior until you see sin as rebellion against God. First and foremost, let's go back to that sin. If David committed adultery to Bathsheba and murdered Uriah, he harmed them. And yet in Psalm 51, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. Well, let's be fair. Family, he destroyed the vow of David and or excuse me, of Bathsheba and, and Uriah. He got between the two greatest statements that you will ever say as a couple, those of you who are married today, those of you who look forward to marry, the statement, I will or I do, signifies a, a partnership and a vow that I won't let anything get between us. David got between that vow. He first lusted on the roof. He invited her to dinner. He not only willfully wooed her, she responded and broke the vow between she and Uriah. As, as he tried to gloss over and cover the brokenness of that vow, he ended up having Uriah killed. Now understand, Uriah was considered in Scripture as one of 30 key soldiers in David's entire army. These men were not only known for their bravery and their skill, but their incredible loyalty to David himself. Can you imagine the rebellion and the, and the disconnect that would allow a man so loyal to him to be treated so horribly? Did he sin against Bathsheba and Uriah? You bet he did. But I want you to understand, even more so, against God. And until you and I understand that, we'll often not understand the incredible impact of our sin. One man describes it this way, the dying groans of Christ show the horrible nature of sin in the eyes of God. As He was greater than the world, so his sufferings declare sin to be the greatest evil in the world. How the evil is that sin must make God bleed to cure it. So family, understand, Jesus goes to the cross not because Adam sinned first, certainly, but because you cut your hours to make your paycheck more rich at work. You bought a magazine that destroyed the loyalty of your mind against your mate. You stole something as a teenager that not only embarrassed your parents, but it got you banned from a store that you never should have gone. Your sin nailed Jesus Christ. Your efforts put Him there. And until you and I understand that our lusts, our desires, our actions are as equally guilty as the nail that drove it, into his hands and feet, then you and I don't understand the incredible nature of transgression. 
your rebellion against God is that costly. Now he comes back and his statement is, you're forgiven. It's one of the cleanest translations we have. Can you imagine? If you'd have done any of those things, if you'd have committed adultery against your mate, and your mate looks over, embraces you, and says, I forgive you, we'll work it out. What love. What love. God on high looked to every act of rebellion on our part and said, I forgive you. He comes back and he says, secondly, blessed is a man to whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Our word now here, iniquity, is the classic word for sin to miss the mark. All right? Missing the mark is a, is a classic hunter's term. All of you who hunt deer and elk should be taking notes at this moment. All right? You missed. You aimed the arrow and you missed. You aimed your rifle and you missed. Here, the target is the law of God. The arrow is your efforts. You didn't measure up. You missed. Now the incredible term that comes on is the complementing term is count. Family, it's a great term. Your sin, I'm sorry, your sin is covered. It's a great term. I want you to walk with me, if you will. All right? I want you to imagine, if you will, the Ark of the Covenant. Picture, if you will, in your mind, your mark. If you've been to Sunday school, it should be an easy thing. Picture, if you will, a large box. Much like those plastic ones that you buy to store things in. You've got a box, two and a half feet, 18 inches, storage box. Inside that box is the handwritten Ten Commandments put there on rock by Moses, written by God, inside. On top of the box is known as the mercy seat. All right? The mercy seat. On top of the mercy seat are now two cherubim, wings pointing and touching one another, and they are looking down on the mercy seat. The presence of God is represented in these touching angels. The seraphim are kind of like the bodyguards of God, as if God needed a bodyguard. You'll see them come in Ezekiel's first ten chapters. They are around God. And they represent the presence of God. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come in. And he lays on the mercy seat the blood sacrifice. All right? Are we tracking everybody? Not if you're not asleep. Okay? You're tracking, right? There's blood across the mercy seat. Now what I want you to understand, the word means covered. So here, you missed the mark. You didn't measure up to the Ten Commandments. God is looking down, if you will, at the target that you should have hit. But having covered God's observation of whether you hit the target or not is the blood of the sacrifice. It covered not only your sin, but God's observation of your sin. In which case, He doesn't count it against you. And that leads us up to our third pairing. And I want you to notice it here in our text. The Lord counts no iniquity. He counts no iniquity. Iniquity means corruption. When you're corrupted, not only do you represent 
corruption, but you corrupt anything around you. That's an easy thing to imagine, all right? Imagine, if you will, you've had rice in your refrigerator in that Tupperware container in the far corner of the refrigerator, right? It's now a little speckled, all right? With unpleasant things, fuzzy blues and greens and magentas that you really just can't identify, right? Now, you've just cooked brand new rice tonight and the family didn't finish it. And since it's Father's Day, Father says, I'm going to put things away. And he realizes, oh, we had rice two weeks ago. I'm going to go grab that same container. I'll put today's rice in. How many of you are going to eat rice tomorrow night? Anybody? That same corrupted rice ruined all of the new rice. So the greens, the blues, and the magentas that were originally there are now part of all of the things. Not only are you corrupted, but you corrupt everything else around you. And isn't that the nature of sin? You just have a way of pulling people down. You have a, a way of not only ruining yourself, but it affects others. And God looks at the whole process of sin from the time of Adam to now and recognizes we've been corrupted and we've spread corruption. And so, understand, he looks down and he says, I no longer count your iniquity against you. Iniquity, corruption. The word count is a bookkeeper term. Think this through. The divine accountant, God the Father, looks down to the ledger that's filled with all of your corrupted life. And by willful action, He takes the ledger that should be yours and He brings it over to the ledger of Jesus Christ. And he takes the perfect ledger of Jesus Christ and he brings it over and he puts it on your account. So that the ledger of Jesus is what the Father sees when he sees you and I in forgiveness. What an incredible picture! So as Christ goes to the cross, he's Paying the corruption that you and I deserve to pay. That's exactly the idea that Paul brings, and he uses the same thought process in the Greek language that David does in the Hebrew language. Listen to Romans chapter 4, verse 5. And he says, and to the one who does not work, in other words, you don't try to fix your own ledger, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. You receive the ledger by grace of Jesus Christ. Not because you work to clean your own ledger up, but because you received the perfect work of Jesus Christ as your personal accounting of your life. You're completely and 100% forgiven. Now I want you to understand, those of you who know Kathy, I have the perfect accountant. All right? Those of you who are not, here, not part of our church family, my wife is an accountant. She does approximately 500 different people's taxes every season. Now my wife is another thing. She's as close to perfect as a human could get when it comes to accounting. And make sure you tell her that the next time you see her, would you? She's not here today. But I want you to understand, if I had that kind of perfect accountant to give me the resources of God, 
rather than the bankruptcy of my life, I would be indebted to that accountant forever. And you and I who've been forgiven and understand what we have been given by the accountant who gave us the ledger of Jesus Christ should be eternally indebted to that accountant. So family, it's summed up here in the big picture. That's how incredibly free you and I are having accepted the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. David recognizing that he's been given the same kind of grace and trusts God in the same power knows that he has been forgiven. So family, I want you to look at how he reports it to us. And in the verses 3 through 7, notice if you will, we want to be examining David's sense of spiritual recovery. David gives us advice from his own life experience. He tells us the impact of unconfessed sin on man. In fairness, I don't think we need to know because we know what it feels like. But listen to David's evaluation in verses 3 and 4. And I believe you can feel the guilt and the depression. He says, My bones wasted away. Have you ever done something so publicly damaging to who you are that it shook you physically? David did. Has it ever affected you so strongly that you were depressed and didn't want to get out of bed? He didn't feel like doing anything. David senses the impact of separation from the Lord. And I want you to understand this loss is the loss of fellowship, not the loss of salvation itself. God will not ignore sin and we will feel the impact of His loss from our lives. So David's advice, as he continues on, is to immediately seek the recovery of repentance. As David sought it, God provided a recovering relationship and a confidence of personal renewal. Family, about that sense of forgiveness and about that sense of personal review, renewal, I want to talk with you a, a moment. What do, you, what do you struggle with? Do you have a sense of the joy of forgiveness? Or sometimes do you look at your sin and go, I'm disappointed. I'm unhappy at the consequences of my sins. I want, to, I want you to walk with me for a moment. When David sinned and killed Uriah and committed adultery of Bathsheba, David was told by God in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10, the sword shall never depart from your house. God begins to give him the consequences of his sin. You'll never, you'll never be a time when there won't be war in your dynasty. You'll always know war. You'll never end without either defending Israel or going out and attacking the variety of vassal states surrounding the country. You will never escape war. Family, let me continue on in verse 11. He will raise up evil against your own house. And so we find a civil war at the hands of his oldest son, Absalom that consumed his latter years. Listen to the next embarrassing thing in verse 12. Your wives will be raped openly as you mistreated Uriah's secretly. So as you had adultery and no one knew, your wives will be raped and everyone will know. And later on in the verse, the child from the union between Bathsheba and you will die. So understand, can you imagine much greater consequence than, than what he just received? 
It is stinging, it is brutal, and it is hard. Yet David was thrilled to be forgiven. So, let's walk back into a world. We have that old adage that we look down to our kids. This is going to hurt me a lot more than it does you. Now, there are times when that ain't true. Right? There are times when you've disciplined your kids and you know what you just did to them hurt them a whole lot more than what you've ever experienced. But there are also times because you're the one responsible that it hurt you far more. You see, discipline is the consequence of the behavior. Now hear me out. The goal of our discipline, though, is repentance, which leads to more mature behavior, and forgiveness, which leads to a maturity in our relationship. You see, we discipline them, not so that we can give a time out, not so that we can have them stand in the corner. That's not why we discipline. We discipline them so that they will not return to that behavior. Isn't that correct? First. Secondly, we want to see our relationship built, matured, bonded, even greater, so that as, as our kids grow up, if you've done the job that God will bless, you will go from capital D, capital A, capital D, Dad. That is your child in youth. Capital D, A, D. That is your kid in middle teens, early 20s. But ultimately, if you've done the job and you've created the relationship that I'm suggesting, the day will come that you're DAD. It's a nickname. Hey, Dad. And you enjoy the bond and the friendship. Why? Because everything that you've done is to train and to prepare for them to live in maturity, to avoid some of the missteps that they could have in adulthood, and to have a bond with you that's rich and wonderful and full and free. And God does the same thing in forgiveness. Consequence of sin may last a lifetime, but God views lifetime in temporal reality. God views eternity as the ultimate relationship, as He builds holiness and character into you, taking you from your sins to maturity and holiness to a relationship that's eternal. David understood that. And he didn't look back at the pain of the consequence, but he looked at the reality of the forgiveness. And in light of that, he was willing to take anything that God said he needed in order to know the joy of living in forgiveness. Family, he says this in chapter 51, in verse 14 of Psalms, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. In other words, family, even the sacrifices are the consequence of sin. But what God is seeking in doing the sacrifice is a broken heart that wants a restored relationship with Him. Having rebelled, having missed the mark, and having created a ledger that is so filled with guilt. God wants forgiveness. Now, I want you to see, it's almost as if God comes into the picture here in verse 8 through 10. And so I want you to see God's advice for spiritual recovery. And just as David gives you advice for repentance and forgiveness, God seems to join in and advise us from his vantage point. He tells us that he has instruction for us from the point of positive perspective. His goal is to teach and instruct us, not to beat us down and punish us. 
He wants our best for us. And He seems to imply that as you see the finish of verse 8. He says, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. He says, I'm looking at you to give you my best. I want you to, to, to act like me. I want you to have character like me. I want you to see my thought process. So please, see what's happening in your life from my advantage point and know that I'm giving you good. God says the actions are loving and the purpose to increase and build the maturity of our relationship with Him. So He asks us to repent and not be a stubborn mule needing a bit to forcefully do what the rider desires. He says, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to draw you back by force. I don't want to make you to do this. I want you to run to me. I want you to seek forgiveness. And then I want you to notice as we finish, in verse 11, there's a sense of rediscovered joy. Family, in order to really impact your, your life and understand verse 11, you have to run back to verse 7 to understand it all. Notice, if you will, verse 7 first. You, God, are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. Now notice the third. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. So let's look at that last one. If you will, God's coming up and saying, hey, have you seen your ledger? It's clean! I held Jesus responsible! You're clean! Hey, did you notice? Hey, you're all covered over! I don't even see how you missed the mark anymore! The blood of Jesus Christ has covered you. Do you see that? Hey, rebel. Hey, terrorist. I've forgiven you. Come on back. Hey, did you notice? Now, can you picture God doing so? Now come, if you will, to verse 11 and see how it ends. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. O oh, righteous, and shout for joy. All you upright in heart. So family, in verse 10, we see David and all who listen to him shouting for joy. While verse 7, God is shouting that He is offering forgiveness. So you have this antiphonal song going on. Hey, I've forgiven you! That's so cool, God! I can't believe it! I want to sing louder! Hey, terrorist, I've totally thrown away and erased it. You're covered. Oh God, thank You so very much for what You've done for me. And so you have this incredible moment. The Father who seeks our forgiveness is telling us how great He forgave you. And you and I are responding in the awareness of forgiveness. What a privilege. And you and I should always, always look to chapter 32 and say, Lord, how significant is my forgiveness in your eyes? And you will always read this and run away and go complete. 100%. God doesn't hold it accountable to me anymore because I've accepted the work of Jesus Christ. I have Christ and everything that Christ has to offer. And I am in a relationship. I am bound to. I created a vow of I do to God the Father through the work of God the Son. And I am in the family of God in a wonderful, complete, and permanent way. And why would I ever want to rebel against that? Why would I ever want to scrape the covering away so that my missing the mark is evident. Why would I ever want to take the freedom of the ledger of forgiveness 
and remove it so that my guilt is the only thing that's seen when God has removed it and invited me into the family. So family, if you've embraced Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I want you to walk out of here going, oh my goodness, I have been reminded afresh how wonderfully forgiven I am. That's one of the greatest privileges I could ever know. And I want to suggest on the other side, if you're here today, and you've never been told of what Jesus Christ ultimately did for you when He died on the cross for your sins, I want to take a moment and simply remind you of what an incredible gift that was. We've already walked through it. You, who chose to do what you wanted to do, God the Father says, I forgive you. But He forgave you because He held Jesus accountable for what you've done wrong. And you have to simply look down and say, I don't clean myself up. I don't fix myself. I can't do anything about who I am. But I can say that Jesus Christ is my one and only way to be forgiven. And family, that changes everything. That submission allows us to rest in the work of Jesus Christ rather than to trust and rely on my own. So what a great privilege it is to know that you have been forgiven today. And I'm hoping that when you come to church, your volume button goes up just a little bit louder because you've been forgiven and you want to proclaim that. That your ability to worship is just a little more acute because you understand just what God's given you through Jesus Christ. That family, Monday through Saturday, you look down and when we want to walk away, we want to do our own thing, all of a sudden, you remember, this is what God did for me? Well, I couldn't rebel against Him. What a privilege it is to be His and continue to grow in holiness even though you struggle to say, I want to do my own thing, my own way. But I'd rather please Him. Father in Heaven, I'd ask that You'd watch over. Dear God, help us to understand what we've been given today. Dear God, I would pray that You would allow through the Holy Spirit that we hear the shout of God. That shout that reminds us that we've been We've been forgiven. We're, re we're rebellious. We're terrorists. And the government of eternity has forgiven us of our acts of rebellion. That Father in Heaven, we who, who wanted to do right, but when we aimed our ability to do right, we missed and your God in heaven, you covered it over so that the eyes of deity would never see what we've done wrong because he's looking first at the work of Jesus Christ. And your God, in seeing Christ, he does not see, or you do not see, are missing the mark. And Father, I thank you that when you are holding the account of our lives, the only thing you see is the forgiveness and the righteousness given to us by Jesus Christ. So that, Father, what you see is the righteousness of God that prepares us for heaven itself. Dear God, I pray that that have an impact on us as believers. First and foremost, dear God, may it give us a heart of repentance. We desperately need to recognize afresh just who we are in Jesus Christ. Dear God, Jackson County needs to know that righteous people know that they're forgiven and that righteous people are living out righteously to the world around them. Dear God, I would pray that you would give us a renewed sense of our forgiveness. 
Dear God, I'd also pray, give us a renewed sense of the very love of God. That, dear God, equip us to know that we are loved so that we may present to the world the gift of the love of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.